Looking back in the data, Steve finds that at 70% capacity, the best athletes in this test produced about three watts of power per kilogram of body weight. Now the airframe designers have a starting point. But before they can fix the size and configuration of the plane, they have to decide how fast it needs to fly, because airspeed has a profound effect on power. The power required of the aircraft, of the aircraft's engine, in this case the pilot, goes as the cube of the airspeed. That is, if you double the airspeed, you have to produce eight times the power to fly the aircraft. So uh, you can see that it's very sensitive. Just a small increase in speed demands a lot extra of the pilot. But the speed has to be tailored to the goal, a long flight over water in a region notorious for sudden winds. The faster the plane flies, the less chance it has of getting caught in bad weather. So we have this trade-off between the size of the weather window, the amount of endurance that, that the pilot has, and the speed of the aircraft. And basically, we arrived at a compromise. Uh, as in all engineering design, it's always a compromise. We think that the pilot is capable of producing the required power for four to five hours. That translates to about 15 miles an hour for the airplane. Everything depends on adapting the plane to the limited amount of power that the pilot can produce. That means that no power can be wasted. For the designers, the two things that most affect power are the plane's weight and the performance of the wing. The team's aerodynamicist is Mark Drela, an MIT graduate and now assistant professor of aeronautics. He designs the airfoil using a computer program he developed for his doctoral dissertation, a kind of simulated wind tunnel that allows him to consider hundreds of different shapes for the lift as well as the drag they produce. At some point, Depending on the airfoil shape, the stream of air close to the wing changes from smooth laminar flow to rough turbulent flow, resulting in profile drag. The transition should happen about two-thirds of the way back from the leading edge to minimize the problem. Once satisfied with the airfoil, the designer faces another problem, an unavoidable byproduct of lift called induced drag. Because lift results from higher pressure below the wing than above, air wants to flow around the wing tips from the bottom to the top, which creates vortices of air spinning off the tips. These vortices rob energy from the power plant by retarding the forward motion of the plane. Induced drag can account for as much as three quarters of the drag on an HPA, which is mostly wing to begin with. The design team has already estimated the weight of the plane, and Drela knows that he needs 330 square feet of wing to produce enough lift. He can't eliminate induced drag, but he can reduce it with a long, narrow wing. It will produce the same amount of lift as a short, wide wing of the same area, but will spread its influence over more air, resulting in lower pressure across the span and therefore less violent vortices at the wing tips and less wasted energy. It looks good on the computer, but will it fly? That depends largely on how much it weighs. Wire braces could save weight by reducing the amount of internal structure, but that would create too much drag. So the long wing will have only one wire below to help prevent it from bending up in reaction to the force of lift. Most of the wing's strength will depend on its main spar. The problem is making it strong, but light. That job belongs to Juan Cruz, a sometimes MIT student with considerable expertise in the field of advanced composite structures. He plans to use a new material called graphite epoxy, which has the strength of aluminum at a fraction of the weight. Strips of graphite fiber embedded in epoxy are wrapped around a form in layers based on calculated stress points. Later, the epoxy will be cured in an oven and the form removed, leaving an ultralight graphite tube. This experimental material is what puts the whole concept of Daedalus within the realm of possibility.
By the summer of 1986, the Daedalus team has moved into MIT's experimental flight facility at Hanscom Field outside of Boston and is well into construction of the Light Eagle, a prototype for the Daedalus plane that will prove or disprove all the theoretical design ideas. The airfoil shapes are carved out of blocks of styrofoam on a hot wire cutting machine, which takes its instructions directly from a computer. This homemade machine guarantees a precise replication of Drela's airfoil design. After months of work, it's time to see if the wing is really as strong as it's supposed to be. Three hundred and fifty pounds of water hang from the spar to simulate the kind of load it must be able to take in flight. No graphite structure has ever been pushed this hard before, and if it fails, the project is in serious trouble. This makes me nervous. Pretty good. Yeah, looks all right. Okay, here we come. That's it. As the wing passes its first test, an amateur triathlete named Lois McCallan begins training as the first pilot. She's already proven her ability to produce the required power in the lab at Yale, and now she's learning how to fly. Lois will log hours of flying time in gliders and ultralights before she's ready for a human-powered flight. Meanwhile, the designers are getting closer to having a plane ready for her. Except for a few metal screws, every piece of the aircraft is handmade. Mechanical designer Bob Parks has spent nearly two months building the gearboxes which will transfer the pilot's power to the propeller. Mark Drela has spent at least 100 hours on the propeller alone. 20 hand-cut airfoil sections go into what is essentially a small rotating wing that will produce thrust instead of lift. One night in September, the drivetrain is ready to test. The theoretical phase of this project is coming to an end. Early one morning in October, the Light Eagle, wrapped in a skin of lightweight mylar, is rolled out onto the tarmac at Hanscom Field. Lois has been sealed into the temporary fuselage and is about to find out what it's like to fly under her own power. Okay, all set. Sure. All set. Okay, let's roll it. Okay, more. As you're taxiing on the ground, you hear the, the landing gear rolling, and it's pretty loud. And all of a sudden, the noise is gone, and you think, my God, I'm in the air. <laughs> and you just keep pedaling. After 13,000 man-hours of work, the Daedalus project is officially off the ground. Here we are, it works, <laughs> you know, we can do this. It was just, you know, this is the moment we've been waiting for, and there it was. Now it's time to test the limits of the plane and the pilot.
In the high desert of Southern California is Edwards Air Force Base. Generations of aircraft from the X-1 to the space shuttle have proven themselves in the sky over this dry lake bed. And now the Daedalus team is here at NASA's Ames Dryden Flight Facility to escape the New England winter and to see how far their plane can fly. The Light Eagle has its finished fuselage with electronic instruments on board. A mast and temporary support wires have been added on top to protect the wing from damage during test flights. But the team must now face a troubling problem that they've known about for some time. At 88 pounds, the Eagle is 20 pounds heavier than it was supposed to be because the particular type of graphite they wanted had not been available. That extra weight requires more power to fly, more power than Lois is able to produce for extended flights. The engineers have done everything they can to improve the efficiency of the plane. Finally, they install longer wingtips to increase lift and reduce the drag even more. With the last technological card having been played, Lois sets out to fly the Eagle as far as she can. My greatest fear was, was disappointing the group and not being able to, to perform in the plane the way that they wanted to see it perform. And that, that was a real concern. I, I didn't want to let them down. Attitude looks good. Maintain level attitude. Keep the power in, keep it taxiing. Stop here, Ethan. 37 minutes later, she sets down, having flown a little over 10 miles around the lake bed. It's a world record for human powered flight by a woman. But she's reached her physical limit. For the team that hopes to fly 72 miles across the Aegean Sea, there's no alternative now but to look for a stronger pilot. They find what they're looking for in a 25-year-old medical student named Glenn Tremel, a good athlete who also happens to be an experienced pilot. In the lab, he produces 13% more power than Lois. It's a small difference, but it may be enough to put him over the long endurance threshold when flying the Light Eagle. He proves that it is by flying 37 miles around the dry lake bed with energy to spare. It's the longest flight ever in an HPA and strong evidence that the flight from Crete is possible. Lois stays on as a member of the team, but is no longer a pilot, a victim of the unforgiving physics of flight. Six months later, the Hanscom Field hangar is active again. Because of the ominous possibility that it may take more than one try to make the flight from Crete, two Daedalus planes are under construction. Harold Youngren, a veteran of the team's early human-powered flight days, has taken a leave of absence from his job to supervise the engineering. Drawing on the experience with the Light Eagle, he's determined to achieve perfection with Daedalus. Every unnecessary gram of weight is stripped away. Even the adhesives are rationed out. The overall strength of the plane is reduced to the bare minimum. This time, they have the right kind of graphite. It has greater stiffness, so they can get away with using less of it, saving even more weight. Each plane takes 15,000 man-hours to build, so more undergraduates have been recruited to help out. With all the refinements, the planes should be under 70 pounds. 
Even so, they aren't taking any chances with the power supply. Four world-class competitive cyclists have been recruited to fill out the pilot team. That one's a Porsche and this one's Greg a Zach, Frank Scotia, Eric Schmidt, and Canelos Canelopoulos all have greater power and endurance than Glenn Tremel, but none of them have his flying experience. So while the Daedalus planes are under construction in Massachusetts, the Daedalus pilots are in California learning to fly. They also keep up an intensive training regimen, cycling at least 400 hard miles per week. But even this kind of conditioning won't guarantee success. The estimated flight time from Crete has increased from four to six or even eight hours due to the likelihood of headwinds. A flight that long presents serious problems no matter how good the condition of the pilot. After three to four hours of heavy exercise, the body depletes its reserves of glucose, an essential energy fuel. When this happens, power output drops dramatically. For the Daedalus pilot, that would mean a splash landing in the ocean. Dehydration would also be a problem on a six hour flight, since the pilot will sweat more than a quart of water per hour. Dr. Nadell solves both problems at once with a drink designed to replenish glucose, water, and salt at the same rate that they are lost. With the help of this drink, each pilot is able to complete a six-hour endurance test at flight power. 